I'm standing in front of a little pond that's uh, the water coming out of a spring here in the Honeycomb Buttes. It's been flowing here ever since I first saw it in the late 60s. And I've always drunk out of it right, right from the spring where it comes out of the ground on the other side of this pond. Back then in the 60s, this water flowed about two miles out into the desert. It had lush green grass growing on the banks of this little stream. And two major events happened where I couldn't drink out of it. And that was first with the oil boom in the 1970s, late 1970s. There were oil rigs uh, that you could see lights of at night uh, across the flats out here and three oil rigs on top of the honeycombs that were visible from this point. And uh, they made a lot of noise. The lights were obnoxious at night, so I didn't come out and camp here at, at, during that period. And the animals seemed to be scared away. There were, at that time, lots of antelope and wild horses here. About 600 head of Appaloosa horses used this area. That was before uh, the Wild Horse and Burrow Act removed all of the Appaloosas here and most of the other horses in the Red Desert. And they would all come to these three springs through here. There was one about a mile from here, this one, and another one a little over a mile uh, to the west of us here. This spring, though, I didn't drink from during that oil boom period in the late 70s to early 80s because the water smelled bad it had an oil slick on the top of it, and it uh, looked murky. And I know that had to be related to those oil rigs that were up here. Because before that, you'd never smelled sulfur in the water, and it didn't have an oil slick on it. It was crystal clear. Uh, during that oil boom period, though, when government was subsidizing oil exploration, uh, this area had a lot of drilling going on, a lot of people driving around in, in their trucks, shooting animals indiscriminately because they weren't really from this area. They were mostly young people from cities trying to make a lot of money. They had no respect for the land. People were hunting them out of season, not for the meat, but just to shoot them. And the water was contaminated. So the antelope and the elk and the wild horses that would come to this place stopped coming to this spring and several other springs I knew of that uh, were no longer usable because somehow the oil drilling had contaminated the fissures that are the water source underground for these springs. But now that the oil drilling has stopped in this area, it's a wilderness study area here in the Honeycomb Buttes, this water is pure again. It's, it's drinkable. I just drank some. Uh, I drank out of the spring here uh, about two months ago and it tastes good again. In fact, when you go to where the water comes out of the ground, uh, you can see bubbles, and if you follow the bubbles down to the surface of the ground under the water, you can see the sand moving where the water's actually coming up. And that's where it's not contaminated by animal feces and uh, other animals stepping in the water. So I've seen this thing change a lot of times. In 1988, you couldn't drink out of this spring because there wasn't enough water. The 88 drought dried up most of the springs I knew of in the Red Desert. Uh, about 15 or 16 of them that I know of that have never come back since 1988. We got no snow that previous winter and no rain through the entire year. So string, springs dried up that never came back. And the ones that did come back, like this one, uh, only flow a couple of hundred feet now where they used to flow for miles. So that's a natural, probably a natural uh, cause for a disturbance in underground water as opposed to oil drilling, which is unnatural. So these things happen over time and the recovery of this spring is, is encouraging, although it's not as prolific as it used to be as a water source, it's, it's good water again. And you can look in the ground and see elk tracks and wild horse tracks and the droppings of antelope and deer in here. 
and also some of the predators. You can see badger uh, droppings and fox all around these springs because they support a tremendous diversity of wildlife. Birds, small animals, rabbits, ground squirrels, and the predators that feed on them are all evidenced right here. Springs like this one behind me are really important because although uh, there's a tremendous number of animals that use these uh, three springs that are here in the Honeycomb Buttes, they're all out in front of the Badlands themselves. The Honeycomb Buttes is, is about six miles of Badlands, uh, six miles deep and about 20 miles long with a lot of cover and a lot of forage for food but all of the water occurs in three different springs along the front of the honeycombs and they have to come out if, if animals want water they have to come to these little points of, of concentration for animals to use the water and if you look you can see trails coming in there's a trail going this way coming straight into this hole back behind me there's another trail that you could see for about a quarter of a mile out in this direction. It's a trail that animals use to come straight to the water and they'll wait till evening generally. Sometimes early in the morning you can see wild horses, elk, and antelope all watering at the same time. Which makes this kind of a unique place. Unique uh, partly because this whole basin has a, a large number of large and small animals in it due to the abundance of water. It is the largest herd of pronghorn antelope here in this basin. 50,000 antelope they estimate. Also there's probably about 2,000 head of elk in here which is the largest elk, desert elk herd anywhere in North America. Oil drilling can affect these springs in a way that make them unusable for the wildlife that are here. So these are precious places that need to be protected and uh, preserved for the unique wildlife situation we have in this desert. When you walk through the Honeycomb Buttes, at any part of it along the 20 mile stretch, you find plenty of evidence that there have been people here for a long time. There's no roads in there anymore because it's a wilderness study area, but there's uh, evidence of people who built shelters with these black rocks for uh, what we call teepee rings. I don't know what kind of shelters they were, but they may have been teepees. But you could find what appears to be whole family groups, maybe whole small villages of, of people that built shelters with these stone rings around them as part of the shelter evidence. And there used to be a lot of those. But over time, these teepee rings disappeared. And in some cases, it's because of heavy rain or a really deep snow winter. The runoff from melting snow will wash this clay down and uh, cover over the rocks that are the teepee rings. And in other cases I've talked to people who actually came in with their families and let the kids play with the teepee rings and roll the rocks around so now you can't see that they're teepee rings anymore. So there's, I don't know if it's lack of respect or lack of knowledge. Certainly the native cultures respect those places and, and they don't damage these uh, places where people have been living and in providing food for themselves. There needs to be education for these kinds of uh, places and, and people who use them. This is an important place that uh, should be kept intact.